Terrific, thank you. So I will start us off. So welcome everybody to the Research Data Policy Standardization and Implementation Interest Group here at Costa Rica. No, really, we're all online. <laughs> Most of us are welcome. Um, so my name's Natasha Simons. I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons. So I'm um, located in Brisbane, Australia. And um, I am a co-chair of this group. The chair of the group is Ian Hanaskowitz from uh, PLOS. Uh, my co-chairs are Simon Goody from Wiley in Melbourne, um, Rebecca Grant from Springer Nature in the UK, and Rebecca's on leave today, so she's not able to join us, and Azar Hussein, who is from JISC in the UK. So today we are going to go through a number of things that we've been doing in this group and some proposals. So we're going to start with a welcome to the interest group, just a bit of a recap on our objectives and our progress to date. Then we'll go into an early adopter story, uh, an early adopter story of our um, master journal, data journal policy guidelines, starting with um, the pilot that was done through Slovenian journals. And that will be done by Janis Stieber from the University of, I can't say that, Lab, uh, let me have a go, Labiana. Did I get it close? Something like that. I will ask you, uh, I will ask you know. to forgive me with my pronunciation, terrible Australian English. Um, and you can, you can correct me when it's your turn to give your presentation. Okay, then we're going to go into another early adopter story with the STM year of research data with Joris van Rossum from the STM Association. And then we're gonna look at some alignment with the funders. So how can the work that we've done on standardizing journal data policies be aligned with funder data policies? And we have Jeremy Gielen from the Research Funder Policy Interest Group to, talking about a project proposal for us to consider some joint work in that area. And then we'll go on to the next steps with our group and a wrap up. So in this, we'll be having some time for question and answer and discussion. Plus, we will also be using Menti. So if you're not familiar with Menti, it's a polling tool. So if you need to have, it's actually useful if you have another device handy, like a phone, so that you can have the slides up and have this Zoom session up, but also participate in the poll. So you just go to menti.com and enter the code there. We will again flip back to this slide when you get the chance, or if you see it on your screen now, you can also just um, put your camera on that um, a code and QR code and um, go straight to the Menti poll. So just a bit of a background on our interest group. So this interest group started with a rogue birds of a feather session back in Denver in 2016. Um, and I say rogue because it was not actually on the program, um, but Ian helped uh, get us all together. Those of us who were interested in doing something around journal data policies. Um, and the fact that um, they are all very different, not very standardized, makes it very confusing using for researchers and publishers um, to, to actually um, come up with something that, that is easy to understand and easy to apply across different journals. So it started with that idea. So the rationale for the group, it wasn't just journal uh, data policies, but many funder policies as well are different align, differently aligned. So some of them mandate data types, some of them mandate pro, you know, there's different mandates, different, some of them encourage, some of them mandate. It's all very different um, what data they're asking for and so forth. Um, and of course, I mentioned the, the journal data policies, and this was the, the work that we started with. Um, and just to illustrate the problem here, a GISC UK project back in 2014 was unable to create um, a database of journal data policies because they were all so different. They didn't have these common elements. And yet at the same time, we saw a massive growth in the number of journal uh, data policies that were out there. So some work needed to be done in this area. So we got the group together and I've already mentioned our co-chairs and we proposed that our activities build on and be informed by the research that had been carried out by JISC, but also the activities that we were doing with publishers within my organization, the ARDC. At that time, it was ANS, the Australian National Data Service 
Justice, and also the work of journal publishers on data policy. So as I mentioned, we have Springer Nature, Wiley and PLOS all represented in the co-chairs of this group. So some of our objectives were to define the common frameworks, identify priority and stakeholder areas, and use these to produce some guidance for stakeholders on standardising journal data policies, um, starting with journal data policies and going broader into other policies as well and to increase adoption of those policies in a standardised way. And so I am going to stop there and hand over to Ian to pick up from here. Um, yes. I can't hear you, Ian, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, so bingo, we heard the phrase of 2020, I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> so um i'll just uh share my screen um what apologies i'll just make sure i'm showing the right screen Actually, Natasha, would you go back to sharing yours because it seemed to work because it's on the it's on the same deck and I'll, I'll just speak to that actually sorry I've confused my screens here I have I had multiples for very long. And That's no worries, can you see mine? Skill. Perfect, see? yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. just let me move along. Okay. So, yeah, um, very, very briefly, because we've got lots of um, interesting uh, other speakers to get through today. Um, I was just going to remind everybody what the main result, what the main output of our work has been. Um, if you're interested in how we got here, um, then we actually now have a peer reviewed paper that is available um open access in data science journal so you can read about all the consultation and uh process we went through to to get to this 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 main result which is a common framework of uh data policy types that have 14 standard features so that's the the features of the the left hand column there and they are arranged into six different types or tiers enabling a journal to adopt the policy and the set of features which is most appropriate for the community involved in that journal more appropriate for their needs but also appropriate for the goals of that journal in adopting a policy and i think that's really important um, we know that some communities are more ready for more stringent approaches to data sharing than than others and so it's important that if a community or a journal is just getting started with data sharing their goal might be very different to one that is much more advanced so for example if you are a journal that just wishes to start a conversation um, or signal the importance of data sharing you might well uh, wish to choose a policy with fewer requirements and features compared to a journal which is perhaps really trying to ratchet up the quality of the data that is already being shared in its community um, i do want to next slide i do want to call out that um, you know we didn't intend to create a new standard that everybody has to change and adapt to um, or adopt new policies um, by doing all of this research and consultation before we got to this end point you will actually find that all of the existing frameworks from the large publishers from the center for open science and others they should all map pretty well to the framework but what the framework should also do is give anyone with existing policies an opportunity to actually audit and review what information they're providing and see if there are opportunities to, to tweak and enhance and align there. Next slide. Um, this is just one example of how the information is presented in, in, in the paper. So we have some standard features, 14 of them. Wherever possible, we provide evidence for why that feature is important. So here we mention why it's important to have a description of available data repositories. Um, but then what we also provide in terms of supporting implementation, there is standard text provided. So if you need to introduce a policy, there's um, copy and paste um, or modifiable text available under an open access license that you can actually use to, to get started right away. 
Next slide and my last slide, I think, um, and this really just cues up the, the discussion and the speakers that we have to come. So we, we have been working on this since, since 2016, 2017. Um, at the end of 2019, we had a couple of pilot adopters, so Scientific Data Journal, which is a Spring and Nature Journal, and PLOS, uh, where I work. Um, both of those journals or groups of journals um, in PLOS's case adjusted their language on their existing policies to mention the promotion of sharing data management plans. Um, so that was a one very early adopter, but we've actually um, made more progress um, in collaborating uh, with an industry association for publishers, the STM Association, which we'll hear much more about. I think that's really important because we can go further um, work by working with those other organizations that have far greater connections across the publishing industry than just one, you know, one, one RDA project could have. Um, also importantly, as well as publishing, um, publishing the paper, which Google Scholar says has been cited 10 times, and we always use Google Scholar's numbers, right? Because they're the highest. Um, <laughs> but also importantly, um, we've been recognized as a supported output for the RDA. So that was a really important milestone uh, for the initiative. And um, the next three points, um, two of them uh, will be covered in the following presentations, but also what was interesting, one of the papers that cites our paper um, is that the framework has been used as a means to evaluate the state of data policies in earth science and biodiversity journals in Germany. Um, so just another, another example of reuse and impact, which, which, which we're certainly pleased to see. Um, and that's all I have to say. Um, if anyone has burning questions at this point, um, I suppose they may ask them by whatever channel is useful, chat or raise your hand. Um, so I'll pause for a few seconds, but but beyond that, we should hand over to, to Yanez. Um, so any, any urgent questions? Going one. Request the slides already. Um, the other most common requested thing in Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there is a link already in the to the slides, uh, or certainly the slides from Natasha and, and me um, in the um, the document. What we will do is we do have copies of everyone's. We'll just double check with all the other speakers. Are you happy for us to upload them to Google Drive, and then we can provide links as well. Okay, so going once, twice, three times. I think we should we should um, hand over to Yanez Stevie to talk about um, a really interesting adoption story. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can, but it's not in presenter mode yet. Yeah, yeah, I, I need to uh, switch. Now oh, you can see it. I believe. Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Great. So thank you for inviting me uh, to this session. And uh, well, uh, I will just start and describe uh, what we did. Uh, so uh, we had this, uh, as we said, a journalist pilot and uh, with the general aim to improve the data sharing culture in the country. Uh, which is really a, a broad aim, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, uh, in the beginning, it was just to raise awareness, awareness, and then, then um, of course, we we aim to uh, bring some change to the habits as well. And so, uh, the the pilot, the project itself uh, was uh, 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 oriented to uh, the journals that have. Uh, a seat in Slovenia, so the country country journals not 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 very international, but they still have some uh, international audience, uh, both readers and uh, authors. And uh, we aim to introduce data sharing policy uh, among them. Uh, this this was mainly uh, very very new for most of the journals, and of course we use this. Uh, RDA data policy standardization implementation interest group recommendations that Jan uh, just described, a research data policy framework for all journals and publishers. So uh, just I wanted to briefly explain uh, the context of the project itself. Uh, this was part of the RDA Node Slovenia activities. Uh, 
uh, financed by um, EU grant. Uh, this was part, actually sub part of, of the uh, RDA EU 4.0 project where um, uh, we, we uh, got some uh, finance uh, and support to establish uh, a national community, uh, a national node. And uh, uh, IDP, the Social Science Data Archive, uh, which uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, located at, uh, was uh, leading this project. And then there were several partners from university uh, and uh, then uh, Clarin, uh, partner from Slovenia and uh, uh, the, from, from historiography, uh, another center for information exchange. And of course, um, uh, all the members of RDA Note, uh, which was then established, uh, uh, contributed as well, and the journals that were involved. So I briefly uh, explained what was or is still uh, kind of a landscape, a national landscape of the journals and uh, regarding RDA and practice. So, uh, most of the journals uh, uh, are partly financed uh, by the national founder for research. So uh, it's also the fact that the founder has a certain uh, right to impose rules. So, uh, but uh, yes, th this is part of the, the founding, but most of the journals, they, they don't uh, actually have a big budget. And uh, they are located on institutes, research institutes, universities, academic societies. Actually, the, the situation of journals is quite fragmented in Slovenia. Uh, they are uh, small teams and uh, they do their job. Uh, they, they have uh, editors, for example, they, they have uh, their own academic career, but they, they do also the job uh, for, for the journals they, they are in. And, uh, there is uh, little evidence of existing RDM practice there. So uh, even knowledge of uh, this is uh, uh, low. And uh, then um, when we talked about uh, even in previous projects uh, or, or different occasions with, with the journalist representative, they, they uh, express this fear of exposing data, I mean, among the authors of low quality and uh, there are of course no policies for data sharing and um, no, no instructions about citation and uh, also editorial teams, as I mentioned, they are small and uh, non-professional with little technical support. They, they were afraid of additional burden cost of uh, having uh, some new features in the policy. And they fear also that, that uh, they will um, disattract, uh, that, that, that potential contributor will, will be um, turning to some other journals if uh, there will be too demanding uh, policies. So uh, this was the situation and still mainly is in Slovenia, uh, but then we, we in, inside this RDA uh, note, um, project as such, we, we have uh, several activities and one of the activities was, the, was, was this pilot where we started, I mean, even when we designed um, uh, or proposed the, the pilot itself, probably we, we, even, uh, we, even have, we, we were not aware of, of the uh, framework, uh, the, 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 the product of this uh, group as such so uh, just when we start to search uh, for some examples or, or I mean uh, instead of uh, actually going into the uh, our, on our own to an analyze uh, the practice of the journals uh, around the world we find this um, framework where I mean the, the work was already done there were um, uh, the, um, the approach uh, was very handy for our purpose because uh, it was available in, in a sense to, to be adaptable. There were these sample texts, as uh, Jan mentioned already there, uh, that we can then uh, promote or adapt and so on. So um, we, we actually 
did uh, several steps in this um, the whole process of the project. The first step was actually that we prepare the guidelines uh, based on the framework, but the guidelines that were then uh, adapted to the national circumstances. So uh, we we uh, uh, more uh, there was there was more emphasis to the um, in, uh, the introductory part. Uh, introduced these uh, motivations, reasons for data sharing, and uh, um, why why is it important? So uh, to explain uh, the potential users of this guideline, what's the purpose of this uh, open data, and so on, and what are the uh, specifics in this approach? And second uh, kind of adaptations that we uh, uh, move into. Uh, the first step was also adaptation to the national founders policies. Actually, um, there, there is an um, open access strategy that was issued already in uh, 2015-16, and then there was an action plan. So we referred um, to these policies, documents on, uh, for the founder and policy makers on the national policy uh, heavily uh, because uh, I, but probably I will mention this uh, um, later on as well. Uh, the uh, policy wasn't implemented as it was planned. Um, it was very uh, little activities uh, on the part of uh, data sharing, open access to data. Uh, so uh, actually our project was also uh, trying to uh, show uh, how to proceed in this way. But of course, because we have this RDA node project, uh, uh, there was uh, uh, expected uh, that we um, promote also other RDA outputs from other groups. So we did it in these guidelines uh, when we, in different chapters or, or parts of the document, we refer to different guidelines. Uh, and uh, we then published uh, the guidelines, uh, so uh, these were uh, available for the journals that we uh, involved in the next step. So this is just a table of content of these guidelines. So you can see that there was an introduction and then actually the chapters of the guidelines uh, in the second part, they closely resemble the framework. But then uh, this was not copy paste. Uh, uh, of, of the framework uh, approach or, or uh, descriptions and so on, but uh, it was, as I mentioned, this adaptation already there, and uh, we, we we actually try to to make this more kind of acceptable for for the audience. So the next step was there uh, to involve the journals, uh, the pilot cases, as we call them. Uh, so we we actually we we. In the beginning, we had a, a wider list of uh, journals that uh, we might approach, but then uh, we ended with these four journals that you can see there from linguistics, social sciences, history, and archaeology. And um, actually, the partners in the uh, RDA Node project uh, were this, this main partners in the coordination of uh, the project were uh, colleagues from the infrastructure services, uh, as uh, I mentioned already at the beginning. Uh, so this was kind of a design that actually partners in the RDA note uh, suggested the journals that they had some previous contact, maybe personal or, or they were in the same institution or the same field. And so they know each other uh, before, and uh, this was also uh, then easier to, to um, establish uh, cooperation. And then uh, we we did several consultations with the journal teams. So uh, mainly we started with like bilateral, uh, um, the RDA note representative, and then a representative from the uh, the infrastructure and um, team members from a uh, journal where we uh, first introduced uh, all the features of the guidelines and the, the, the uh, framework itself. 
on towards the purpose of uh, all this and discuss already some issues that uh, were there or answered some questions and clarify things. And then uh, we had uh, around the presentations already where, where the drafts of uh, the journals, the draft policies were uh, presented at the RDA node meetings. Uh, so the journals participating were there and RDA node members and uh, we uh, actually exchange so certain approaches or discussed about good and bad um, things that uh, are, were there or some maybe misunderstandings. And finally, we had a conference where they were represented uh, the whole project, uh, the, the conference was dedicated to the journals themselves because uh, RDN Note uh, has uh, different activities and different uh, um, um, events organized, but this one, this one was really uh, um, focused on the journals themselves. And uh, so the, this was also uh, uh, the first uh, public presentation of the draft policies that the, that the journalist teams uh, prepared. And uh, the conference itself was, uh, I mean, 60 journalist representatives were there. So it was uh, probably one of the uh, most attended events that we had uh, in our uh, RDA uh, note activities, which kind of shows that uh, the journalists are in, in Slovenia uh, are, are interested in, in the topic. Uh, and so we hope this will continue. Uh, so I, I, I will just briefly um, try to present some, some results uh, of the uh, draft uh, policies that were there. Um, and so the, um, the fact that uh, the um, colleagues from uh, the disciplinary uh, infrastructure collaborated, help uh, actually to uh, achieve uh, kind of uh, the, the, the policy refer to, to the things that were close to the uh, community or discipline that the journal covers already. Uh, and um, there, there was some commonalities in all those four cases, uh, there was uh, like agreement that uh, they should start uh, slowly to introduce first uh, just uh, uh, um, not, not a requirement, but just uh, recommendations. And uh, um, they also uh, were, were uh, afraid of that uh, authors would, would uh, react negatively if uh, this was too forced. Uh, and uh, then, of course, common reasons uh, were there uh, in, in the policy elements. Uh, uh, they were mainly uh, reasons related to the issues that uh, the journals, um, editors, or, or even the, the, the community um, itself uh, value. Uh, so this ethical and uh, science development principles uh, like transparency of research and uh, disability and uh, things like this. Uh, and also uh, the excitation of data, which was for certain um, journal editors, uh, some new things also was considered as something that motivate uh, the contributors to also to share the data. Then there was also uh, many specifics in the policies. So this was really uh, kind of a surprise for us that really uh, the journals uh, took certain elements and adapt them very closely to the needs uh, of the uh, particular, even narrow um, disciplinary community. So uh, uh, for example, uh, just uh, people from, from uh, the linguistic community, they refer to the, um, uh, about the data definition, what are the, the, uh, criteria, the criteria from the data repository itself, uh, which were there elaborated uh, to, uh, for, for the, uh, those who wouldn't want to share the data. And uh, for example, they also uh, refer to, to the uh, specific citation of uh, search expressions and so on. So, it was really uh, 
we don't have time to, to uh, enter into the details, but uh, you can see a lot of specifics uh, that are in different uh, parts of the policies. Uh, then maybe just uh, as uh, close to the conclusion, so I, I can also mention to, uh, that uh, this role national service providers uh, for different things was uh, really probably a key uh, for a success in a sense that we uh, uh, the, the, that we delivered uh, this uh, draft policy cases in in these four cases of the journals because this um, the, the the people from from the business data services they uh, also offered uh, the uh, where to where to deposit the data the, the answer to this question so they were available for for accepting data and also to uh, instruct about uh, what need to be done for uh, data to be prepared uh, um, in 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 a sense that that it uh, can enter uh, into repository and uh, also they were uh, all all, all the uh, infrastructure services were, were there um, available um, for uh, additional support for the waters when, when these policies will be now implemented uh, live uh, for the journalists, they, they volunteer to be uh, as, as, as a support uh, or advice for the waters service there. So just uh, um, to the conclusions um, now, um, Yes, uh, we can see that uh, the journalist teams, uh, they were quite realistic in a sense that so they, they expected that there may be some issues that we'd really encounter because this is something new and uh, there are a lot of things, uh, which data, how and so on, um, that can be unforeseen. Uh, second uh, kind of conclusion is that Actually, if the, the founder uh, or the national policy would be more enforced already or, or implemented, and then this would be uh, easier for the journalists because now they were kind of, you know, uh, forerunners of the policy implementation. Uh, even uh, the main founder, uh, they didn't uh, implement this. Uh, but uh, the general conclusion is just that, uh, yes, uh, uh, when we talked with, with uh, uh, different people, the RDA framework was really uh, accepted as uh, something because it's based in, in, with this experience of the big uh, publishers around the world and it's something international. Uh, also the RDA framework make this a uh, uh, reliable uh, resource. And uh, actually, a lot of those practical suggestions from, from, from the framework were quite useful to, to follow. OK, thank you. So now, maybe I just stop sharing, or I? Yes, uh, that, would, that would be fine. Thank you, thank, thank you Yanez. Um, really uh, interesting to hear that. Um, hear that and also Natasha and I were just chatting actually on the zoom the zoom chat there the breadth of disciplines that 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 were included um, I'll ask a question actually just on on that note um, were there any particular challenges for the different disciplines that you uh, the, that you worked with on on the pilot well yes of course I mean uh... There, there, there were these details that uh, maybe I, I, I was skipped in from the table, but uh, uh, historiography, for example, this this was really um, a case where where this was uh, from the start a lot of unknown things uh, because uh, in humanities in general there is this uh, notion of data is very vague. I mean they talk about uh, different other um, um, like sources or, or and so on. So uh, it was hard to find examples and also the data which which is there used to, for historiography. It's usually it's uh, in the archives, national archives or some other uh, 
cultural institutions. So this was really a question, what's, what's then the data that we need to share uh, when we write our article? Uh, and they came to this, uh, then to this solution that uh, uh, probably this edit value, the surrogates of the existing materials can be uh, of uh, further uh, use or there for, for replication or, or, or checking and so on. So uh, many, many, many things uh, uh, appears uh, during the discussions. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to mention to everybody um, that we have a mentee poll question related to this first uh, presentation. So I'll just remind everybody um, about mentee. And the question is, what do you think the key challenges are in implementing a journal data policy? Um, so we'll give folks another minute to do that. And uh, Natasha can, can share, the, share the results on her screen. We've also got another question for you, Yanez, on the Zoom chat um we should probably ask that one question and then make sure we get through the talks and then maybe we'll have more time for discussion at the end um so uh, which which question okay mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, i found i found it now sorry it was my it, it, it was me finding the question again so the question is um the social work title used double blind review of data that introduces a significant overhead. Has there been any feedback from the journal about managing this? Yes, well, th this was uh, the, the Social World Journal. Uh, uh, we collaborated with them, uh, our social science data uh, archive, uh, which we, uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, representing. And uh, so uh, we actually discussed about this and uh, they, Kind of found uh, this as, as a problem, the, the requirement that we, that we will uh, post uh, to the uh, data repository that they will use. Uh, and uh, then actually, uh, the burden to uh, enable this, uh, they, they throw to uh, the data service as such. So they ask us, are we uh, able to? Uh, um, provide this kind of service, and uh, we we kind of promise that uh, we can uh, actually um, try to implement it. Uh, maybe not uh, in in very advanced uh, manner uh, because we don't expect uh, a lot of data sets uh, arriving under these conditions. But we can uh, actually. Uh, Pros certain conditions about data access uh, previous to to be published uh, and uh, to be available for reviewers and so so this is uh, kind of yeah the story that, that we have in this uh, behind this. Um, this is Claudia from Brazil. May I just present a single comment? Go ahead. The, the main challenges also depend a lot on which part of the world you live in. The main challenges in Latin America are getting used to the culture. There are no or almost no journals in Latin America with data policies, period. That's all. I feel like I want to ask why, actually, if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, it's data hasn't arrived here yet. I, I'm exaggerating, okay? But it's both a culture from the editorial point of view and also from researchers' point of view who are, let us say, behind Europe and, and North America and, and Australia in this culture of quality data sharing. It's that it's not that they mind they don't they they don't want to share their data. It's the overhead that people are not used to. Uh, just to give you an example, I was talking to the Cielo uh, group of journals. The editor Cielo is the oldest uh, open access network. It's already commemorated twenty seven years. It edits. Uh, 1,200 titles from 17 countries, 
uh, Latin America and, and uh, Africa. All of it is completely open. And there's, a, as far as I, they told me, almost zero journals with any data policy, less than 5%. Okay, and those that have data policies are usually journals that are published in co-publishing with some um, European or US association. Nevertheless, Yellow, uh, by a, a recent report, if I'm not mistaken, in Nature, was among the top uh sources of covid titles this year okay of acts it's it has about six hundred thousand downloads a month okay it has one million uh, papers I, i'm just citing numbers which may not mean anything right but just to give you an idea of its coverage and our uh, first keynote on the first day was Bianca Maro uh, that she talked about La Referencia uh, Publishing Network from um, scientific uh, associations in, in Latin America. And again, she said, we are only now beginning to start thinking of implementing data policies. So. Uh, the the barriers are are very different depending on where you live. I'm so sorry I talked too much. I'll stay. I'll I'll shut my mouth right now. <laughs> well, th thank you very much for the very relevant regional context. I think it, it's excellent that we have that input to the discussion. We wouldn't have got it at, a, at another plenary, I think. So that's excellent. But also, it's a, it's a really good segue into thinking across the whole variety of journals, um, which. Um, is, is something that uh, publishers and journals, which is something that, that Yoris, of course, has been deeply engaged with in the last year or, or more. Um, so Yoris uh, Van Rossum, STM Research Data Director, he's going to give a short presentation about the STM uh, Research Data Year, which is the second of our uh, early adopter stories. I think you should just be able to share your, slide, your screen, Yoris, but any problems, let us know. Yeah, let me use another frequently used uh, sentence. Uh, does everyone see my screen? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Very good. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm with STM, uh, the Scientific Technical and Medical uh, Association uh, for, for medical for publishers. Uh, I'm going to talk about, as you say, in about the research data year and so what we have done uh, this year in terms of rollouts of, of data policies. I'm going to talk about the results, show you some of the um, um, uh, some of the stats, uh, the challenges we encountered, and also the plans going forward. Um, so this, the reason why we started the Research Data Year is actually because we saw quite some very positive um, uh, results uh, previously, um, publishers engaging in, um, in rolling out tools that help in sharing research data. Um, above you see graphs about um, uh, uh, links between uh, journal articles and data sets where Elsevier made quite some progress. Uh, roll out availability statements, for example, with PLOS and BMC. So we saw our publishers that were quite advanced and quite far in, in rolling out these tools. And there are a lot of publishers that were eager also to roll out these tools. Um, so for that reason, we started the uh, research data year. The 2020 research data year is almost uh, done. So um, uh, also nice to, uh, to analyze where we are. And again, the idea is, uh, first of all, it's, it's a practical program to really roll out those tools focusing on three areas. First, sharing research data, linking from articles to research data, and citing. Um, again, um, some publishers are more advanced than others. Um, so the idea is really to allow uh, the more experienced publishers to support the publishers that are new to this uh, and assist them in, in rolling these out. Uh, what do we do? Uh, we have workshops. Uh, of course, we had many more physical workshops in the beginning of the year, who remember those, but uh, so we went also mostly online here. Uh, we have a website, uh, stm-researchdata.org, where we have a lot of information for publishers 
uh, where they can uh, get information on how to implement Scolix, how to implement uh, uh, data policies, etc. But also we have hands-on support in case it's needed. Uh, and also very important, we are very transparent about the progress. So we have a dashboard, if you go to the website, where we really show the progress on uh, how we are doing. Um, so we started with a handful of publishers, and it's really nice to see that there was really a lot of interest. So we have almost 20 publishers now that are part of, that are participating in the program. And participating in the program means that we meet regularly online. Every month we have an online meeting focused on a specific topic. But also these publishers, they share their results in terms of the rollout of data policies, uh, implementation of colleagues, the number of data availability statements they have in articles. Um, again, uh, also being very transparent about the progress we make. So as you can see, it's a really nice mixture of, of the more, the, the larger publishers, and uh, the smaller uh, publishers, uh, but also the mid-sized uh, uh, publishers um, um, that are participating in this program. And it gives us a good reflection on the challenges that these publishers, uh, that the different publishers have uh, in rolling out these tools for research data. Uh, we also participate with a lot of organizations. Uh, of course, the RDA, uh, a very important. Uh, Fair is Fair, we're a Fair is Fair member. At the Center of Open Science, and also we're increasingly engaging with different participants in the ecosystem because we realize this is not something we as publishers can do alone. It's really a, a, an effort um, of, of, again, of funders, of institutions, of, of repositories working together. And that's also one of the focus for us going forward. Um, so again, building on the work of other people, and again, um, a big thank you for the RDA and for this working group. Um, the data policy framework has been very, very instrumental. Uh, it's been a lot of work, uh, very impressive work, and it really helps us, uh, the publishers to, again, navigate through the different uh, data policies, standardizing the terminology. Uh, and it's a, it's a great start for them to, to start to think about it, but also to choose the appropriate level for their journals, their community. So again, we are focused on implementing, but the real uh, work and, and the intellectual work has been done by this working group. So again, uh, on behalf of the publishers, a big thank you, because it has been really uh, very, very useful for us. So where are we now? Um, this is a graph which you can also see on the website. Um, uh, again, we are transparent about the progress. Uh, this is the number of journals with policy. So we have now 19 um, publishers uh, representing about 12,000 uh, journals. And the, the first thing we wanted to start with is to roll out uh, the journal, uh, the, the data policies. Um, and uh, we grew here from 58% in the beginning to 62%. Um, Many of the large publishers like Spring and Nature Elsevier already have most of the journals, uh, um, have, journal, have data policies, the smaller ones as well. It's especially the mid-sized publishers that, uh, that are really now ramping up the number of journals with data policies. Uh, so 63%, that's, that's quite good, but of course we have to, uh, to, uh, to increase that uh, further um, the coming years. Um, the big challenges we really see, and I think that's something we've mentioned earlier, is arts, humanities, and social science. Um, on a very basic level, uh, data doesn't mean uh, the same thing for somebody in arts, humanities than for somebody in sciences. Uh, luckily, we have um, uh, uh, Matt Cannon, I think he's also in, in the call today, and, and Rebecca. Uh, they have started subgroups uh, engaging with publishers uh, in social science and, and arts humanities and thinking about how to address the challenges there. Uh, again, we might um, uh, adopt new, new language or have specific policies for specific areas. So this is, um, uh, I would say, you know, a large focus for us now and also convincing the editors um, the importance of research data. For many areas, it's, it's already clear, but for, 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 for those areas, we, we again, uh, we need a bit more attention there. Um, focus, we have been focusing now on really implementing the data policies, but the next step, of course, is to go higher up. So the larger publishers have been ramping up the number of journals with data policies, often 90 to, 100, to, to almost 100%. And now you see the larger publisher really trying to, uh, to, to, uh, to get higher levels. And that's something also we want to report on in the next coming years, 
not just the data policy, but again, a higher level. Um, so the focus for next uh, year, because it's uh, it's the year is always over, but luckily our activities uh, have have uh, have not been, is really first of all to increase the number of journals um, with um, with data policy, but also making sure that the the, the, the levels are as high as uh, as as, uh, as can as they can. Again, the, 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 the data policies is just one of the things. Of course, the end goal is to have things like data availability statements and articles, which is, of course, coming out of the data policies. We're measuring that as well. Uh, currently, it's about 8%. And of course, the data availability statements and articles will follow the data policy. So we expect this to increase with a bit of uh, time lag uh, uh, to follow from the implementation of the data policies. Um, we're also measuring things like SCOLIX, um, so to what extent uh, links between articles and, uh, and data sets uh, are within SCOLIX, that's currently 35%, also something we're working up to, to ramp that up. Um, so again, uh, many more things we're focusing on uh, the coming years. Uh, so again, the research data year is is uh, is, is almost over, but uh, uh, some people have are speaking about actually making it a research uh, data decade. In any case, it is a uh, uh, it remains for us a high priority, um, and um, the focus for the coming years is and, and we heard it before is really an increasing alignment between. Uh, with with different participants in the in the wider research ecosystem. Uh, the funders, the institutions, repositories, we really have to make sure that we all work together in consistent policies that will help everyone in the end. Uh, so that's also something in this program we're going to continue to focus on. Already this year, we had various meetings and webinars with, with funders, with institutions, and um, that has been, been, been very positive. Um, continue to work on SCOLIX, so to make sure that the links between the, the articles and data sets uh, are in the SCOLIX framework. But also we're thinking about topics beyond sharing and linking and citing. Um, data peer review, for example, is something that is increasingly discussed also in light of uh, some of the things we've seen this year with um, data sets uh, in, in, in relation to, to COVID. Um, uh, making that at least more transparent of what data, what peer review can mean uh, for data, uh, but also increasingly work with repositories, for example. Um, we have now 19 journals. We want, of course, all the participating journals, uh, of all the journals uh, to have data policy. So we're also going to think about expanding the number of publishers we work with, and we can help in implementing policies um, uh, in uh, research data sharing. And again, uh, the focus is really on making it a research data decade. Uh, we see good progress, but much more has to uh, has to be done. And I think we made a really good foundation of working with a lot of publishers, but again, also with with you and building on your work and will be, and working with uh, with more participants in the ecosystem. So uh, we're going to continue this uh, this work. Um, so again, thank you. If you want more information, so we have the website with uh, with a lot of information around the research data and uh, any questions, uh, ask now or send me an email later. Thank you. Thanks, Joris. Uh, we have uh, five minutes or so for questions, but um, before we do that, just a reminder, Menti uh, is open, has a question related to your presentation, um, and it is how should we measure success of standardized data policies. So uh, thank you, Natasha. Um, folks' responses will, will start to display there. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I will I'll have a look to see what's been going on in, in the chat. Um, discussion again about the, the social sciences and humanities subgroup, Yoris. Could you maybe just explain how that's working? Um... Yeah, so I would so we we have a general working group. So every month we come together and we address more the the, the, the general themes, but we also have separate working groups talking about specific challenges in the in these areas. Um, so for example, arts humanities. Um, what we realize is first of all is to come to a definition what research data really means for for arts humanities, but also come we're striving for example we're thinking about doing some kind of declaration also making sure that that all the the journals in our humanities are aligned on this 
one of the fierce journals have is if if one journal implements a data policy and the other journal doesn't that might lead to some competition between journals um, but again we basically use these groups to think about specific challenges specific priorities and addressing them through that uh, through the working group i don't know matt is actually on the call and he's leading one of these groups i don't know if he wants to maybe add something yeah thanks yoris um, thanks matt yeah just to say that so we had an initial call with the various publishers who decided that um, they all signed up for the, the research data year and we did some um, kind of asking about who'd be interested in, in kind of thinking about this area in more detail. And one of the first things that we decided was that actually we wanted to deal with these separately. So we didn't want to have a social science and humanities group. We needed to, we decided that actually dealing with the humanities separately from social sciences would be um, of most value. Um, and we've only had, I think, one meeting so far where we've talked about humanities and social sciences separately. And then we've currently got um, other meetings that are being put in before the end of the year to kind of continue these discussions. Um, I think Joris has described what we talked about for the humanities, um, but then for the social sciences, um, because there's such breadth uh, across the social sciences, and there's some areas that probably align a bit more with the humanities areas and some that align more with some of the life science and science areas, um, how valuable that would be. One of the things that we're considering is whether thinking about it in terms of the research methodology. So actually, do we need to think more about how qualitative versus quantitative research might need some slightly different approaches? Um, but again, these are still all in the really early stages. Um, and so we're happy to happy to get more input and um, get more people involved in these calls. They've been quite small groups so far. So um, I think maybe five or six people in one session and, and four or five in the other. So there's definitely space and scope for, for more people to get involved. And we're happy to, to get more input to ensure that we can have something that adds value to the great work that's already been done on, the, on these policies. Thanks. Um, any other questions or observations on, on some of the responses coming through here? Um, well, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's great to hear the call for a research data decade. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. I think everyone on this call probably would go for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we're right on time for our um, next presentation. Uh, so we're very pleased to welcome Jeremy Geelan, who um, is going to tell us about a proposal for a project on funder publisher policy alignment, um, which um, is very relevant um, as uh, Natasha reminded us right at the start of this discussion that the scope of this group wasn't just on journals that that just is where we begun for, for good reasons so um, Jeremy um, is a senior advisor in knowledge translation strategies in the science policy branch of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research um, so Jeremy um, you've already started sharing your screen fantastic we're all getting very used to this system now uh, um, over to you to, to tell us about this, this project proposal. Okay, uh, thank you, Ian, and um, hello, everybody. Um, as uh, Ian said, um, well, my name is Jeremy Yeelan. I'm a senior advisor at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, where I lead um, CIHR's open science policy development, but also work on open science policy development uh, across of Canada's three uh, major federal research funders. Um, but I'm also a co-chair of the RDA interest group, uh, Research Funders and Stakeholders on Open Research and Data Management Policies and Practices. And I'm here to uh, discuss with you today a possible project that we're interested in pursuing in collaboration uh, with uh, your IG, the Data Policy Standardization Implementation Interest Group. Uh, but before getting into that, I'll just provide a, a really quick overview of the Re Research Funders and Stakeholders IG. Um, like many interest groups, uh, you know, we, we had our beginnings in uh, various birds of a feather sessions, uh, which we had at uh, RDA 10, 11, and 12. 
Um, our first uh, actual IG meeting uh, took place at RDA 13 in Philadelphia, and we followed that up with an IG meeting at RDA 14 in Helsinki. Uh, the, the chairs of the group, in addition to myself, are David Carr from the Wellcome Trust, Yasushi Ogasaka from the Japan Science and Technology Agency, and Dina Paltu from the National Institutes of Health. So our group really has two um, overarching objectives. Uh, the first is to provide a venue for funders and where applicable other stakeholders to bring forward issues for discussion with the broader RDA community. And the second objective is to develop deliverables useful to funders and ideally other members of the RDA community and research data ecosystem. Uh, to date, uh, we've really uh, just completed one deliverable uh, and that was a survey of um, current funder policies, benefits and challenges in developing and implementing open research and RDM policy requirements. And we discussed those survey findings at RDA Helsinki. By building on this work, we're interested in pursuing a project with dated policy standardization, IG on funder publisher policy alignment. Uh, the rationale we see for this is that um, funder and publisher policies influence and motivate data sharing by researchers. Uh, there's a need uh, for policy alignment in order for research data policies to be maximally effective. Um, for example, there's a need for alignment between funders, and that's, um, I think that's pretty well recognized um, by funders. Uh, there's a need for policy alignment between publishers, and I think what we've heard today is that uh, the publishing um, community recognizes that need. But there's also a need for alignment, policy alignment between funders and publishers. And yet comparatively little work has been done to examine funder publisher policy alignment. So the objective of this uh, potential uh, collaborative project would be uh, to examine funder publisher policy alignment. And secondly, to provide recommendations on how to improve that alignment. And the initial areas of focus that we're considering working on and investigating are data management plans, data repositories, and data availability statements. So there are several steps um, that we're proposing for this project, uh, which I'm happy to discuss with you today. Um, now, the first step in the project is really just project validation. So we're partly doing that um, uh, at, at RDA this week and this session and others. Uh, discussing the project, the project plan, um, getting feedback on it, uh, as well as the initial policy elements that we intend to invest investigate, and also to hear any uh, expression of, expressions of interest people might have to take part. Um, and then we're envisioning three phases to the project. Uh, the first phase, it would be focused on uh, research and analysis. So this is essentially research on the policy environment, and that would entail investigation through liter literature review uh, and possibly surveys and interviews into, into funder and publisher policies. Uh, the second step in this first phase would be an analysis of the alignment and misalignment uh, uh, of the funder and publisher policies uh, and, and potentially um, you know, mapping this analysis and doing this analysis um, along uh, the researcher workflow. So recognizing that um, funder and publisher, funders and publishers don't necessarily make their policy interventions um, at the same point of the research life cycle. So for example, DMPs are often required um, at the front end, at the beginning of a research project, whereas you know, uh, researchers are, are responding to um, repository requirements, for example, uh, closer to the end of the research life cycle. Um, so granted, given that, it, it could be interesting to examine the, the alignment and, and, and misalignment along uh, the workflow, workflow process. That's something we're, we're considering. Uh, and then um, the, the final step in this first phase would be uh, developing a report on what we find in, uh, in our analysis of the uh, publisher funder alignment. The second phase would be focused on um, developing recommendations to improve alignment. So this would involve, um, first of all, stakeholder engagement uh, to discuss the phase one findings, as well as um, how we could use those findings to develop uh, recommendations uh, for policy alignment between funders and publishers. 
And secondly, uh, the second step in this phase would be developing the recommendations. So uh, developing draft recommendations, uh, which we would submit for community review. And it would really be an iterative development where we would you know, bring uh, drafts to the community, um, get feedback, revise the recommendations, uh, and then finally finalize them. Uh, and then the, the third phase would be uh, you know, the application of the recommendations. So firstly, uh, disseminating them, but also uh, exploring the use of the recommendations as a basis for continued policy alignment. And this could include various activities, but for example, if feasible, it could include uh, piloting uh, the adoption or implementation of the recommendations. So, you know, I'm, I'm here to, because, you know, the group is really interested in, in hearing uh, feedback on and uh, suggestions uh, on this uh, proposed project, reactions to it. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have, um, but I've also provided here um, some uh, questions to kind of foster discussion. So for example, interested in hearing what you think of the project and elements of the project plan, any suggestions on stakeholders to engage with this project and even uh, expressions of interest to participate. So that's it. Thank you, Jeremy. I feel free actually to, to leave those questions um, just on screen if, if folks want to give that um, a bit of consideration for, for a moment. There is also, I think, one or, or maybe even two Mentipol questions uh, related to your presentation as well. Um, but yeah, as this is should be an opportunity for folks to feed into the design of this potential initiative, let's um, see if anyone has any um, questions, comments in, in response to these, these Jeremy is posing on screen now. I think it's terrific, Jeremy. I think it's going to be a challenging project, um, really. Uh, there's quite a lot of work involved in it, but it's definitely worthwhile doing. Um, yeah, because the funder policies are going to be as different as the as the journal policies have been, and then then we have the added complexity of trying to align them. Um, but we have to start uh, somewhere, and I think. It's a terrific initiative. Yeah, thanks, Natasha. And I, yeah, I, I do. It, it is uh, quite a project, and I do think it would be a lot of work. But um, uh, you know, uh, as you mentioned, I think I mean, just even from uh, CIHR's interest, it um, I think there's a real appetite among um, folks. Uh, I mean, my team uh, and and other folks who are working in open science to have a better understanding of the publishing environment and what kind of policies exist there, uh, but also to help uh, bridge, uh, build kind of deeper links um, to, to publishers, uh, just so we can, you know, kind of move forward uh, together on the, the same footing as best we can. So I hope that this project could help uh, along those lines as well. Yeah, I think, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, this is a, a, actually one of our focus for next for the next uh, next year. So we're very interested to participate in this. I think it's a great initiative. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And similar, I want to give another statement of support. Uh, I'm one of the chair of the Fair Sharing Working Group. Uh, hi, Jeremy. And I know we will present in your session later tonight, but absolutely, I think there is also an intersection with what the Fair Sharing Working Group is doing within the RDA, which is, although focused more on standard repository, but it's, it's, it's especially to align the policy of the funders and now the interest in, in aligning funders, sorry, of a publisher, and then now the interest of aligning the policy of the publisher with the funders, it's an absolutely additional element. We would like to help and collaborate. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Jeremy, I was just going to, to ask what consideration would be given or, or has been given to scope of the project. Um, into, is there a um, specific, more limited group of agencies you would anticipate looking at before potentially scaling up or, or adjusting course of the project, depending on what you find? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think, I mean, scope is certainly something we'll be uh, thinking 
seriously about following, uh, you know, the, these meetings. Um, I mean, our uh, the survey that we conducted about a year ago, um, we had 43 uh, respondents to it, funding agency respondents. So quite targeted, but also not 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 a small group in terms of uh, funders either. Uh, but I, I do think there would be, um, I, I think it would be advantageous to, you know. Uh, select a certain, uh, perhaps a smaller uh, group of funders, so that we could, you know, do a, a very uh, thorough investigation of what what they currently have by way of data policies and potentially even what they're planning. And um, you know, in terms of what uh, what funders those could be, I mean, they could, I mean, just in terms of practical matters, they could reflect um, kind of the uh, you know the interests of whoever's involved in. Um, working on this. So, I mean, for, um, you know, for CIHR, that could include, you know, health and biomedical funders, but we'd have to see who's involved. Um, yeah, I think, so I think that that's kind of a discussion we need to have is how to kind of scope the, the project uh, in the best way. And I think also, I mean, I, I kind of have this sense that I don't necessarily know what I don't know when it comes to um, uh, what the policy environment looks like. So the first the very first step in this project, um, I think, which, which would be part of phase one, as I discussed, but really just getting a handle on what we know and what we don't know and what we, and, and then to know what we don't know, you know? Uh, so, and, and I think after doing that, we'll, we'll be able to determine a bit more clearly what, what the scope should be in terms of, um, you know, the, the funding agencies to look at. And then, you know, we would be looking for kind of input from your group, uh, certainly here and elsewhere, um, in terms of how to approach examining, um, you know, the, the policy requirements of publishers and what the scope should be there. Yeah, yeah, um, that's, yeah, that's, that's great to hear. And um, well, I'm hoping that the efforts of this group should at least make that first task a little bit easier, yeah, yeah. <laughs> given, given not just this group, all the, all the publishers who have, who have, who have um, worked on policies in the last few years as well. Um, but yes, absolutely. Um, personally, and I'm sure I can speak on behalf of the, the rest of the chairs, um, this is a really important collaboration um, and sort of thinking about how we organize ourselves um, if, this, if this, this goes ahead um, to support it is, is, is um, something we should you know, uh, pay a lot of attention to. Um, we have some questions, responses coming in to the Menti poll actually. And I think this might be interesting because one of the, the next question is relevant to the scope of the project. Of course, this is a you know, quick, um, quick crowdsource of, of these different things, but um, I think could be, could be interesting. Um, oh, sorry, I'm thinking about the next question. First question um, is, are you in favor of funder publisher policy alignment? Um, I'm wondering if the person who said no would like to explain their answer, but I, I'll not put you on the spot. I am curious, but um, if they're, it, it, you know, it's important to to hear any any counterpoints um, if uh, if they're available and willing. Uh, this is Claudia. I did not say no, but I wanted a maybe. You know. Sure. Not just yes or no. So I said yes. Well, uh, Claudia, um, maybe you could explain why um, uh, why your answer would be maybe. Uh, okay, uh, you know that I'm I am myself, but I'm also representing a funder, right? And we've been uh, repeatedly, which is nowadays the top funder and and maybe all of Latin America, at least in terms of stability and the number and amount of projects it funds. And um, the issue here is that we've been asked by different coalitions, uh, open access, so on, to join them. And all of these requests have some sort of catch concerning data. So uh, we find open access, that's, in fact, open access is compulsory by the agency, open data has become compulsory for all data uh, funded in projects funded by the, the agency. Uh, but uh, we find that all of the policies that are proposed 
in Europe or in the United States do not actually match ours in terms of uh, what researchers would then commit themselves to. Okay. Um, it's always some clause. I cannot be more specific, but we can discuss this later and I can show you examples. Okay, yeah, that, that'd be great. I, I guess maybe to respond to something that, that you mentioned there, Claudia, was, um, you know, in, in doing this work, um, I mean, say, say I reached out to Papesp uh, with a set of questions about what, what your current um, uh, data policies are, um, you know, that, that research that we would be doing and how that would feed into the recommendations, it wouldn't, I mean, the pest wouldn't be bound to anything. I mean, you wouldn't be bound to the recommendations. Yeah, I understand. It's just that it would be a recommendation for alignment. But of course, it depends on what the recommendations are, you see. So at, at, we would be for alignment. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, no, 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 don't. No need to uh, be sorry because I, I, I think I, I understand what you're, what you're pointing to, and I think also alignment is a bit of a, that that's a little bit vague. Uh, that word. I mean, I, I, I mean, I could imagine certain proponents of open science uh, hearing the phrase alignment between publishers and uh, funders, particularly if they are uh, advocates of open access publishing. That, that might not sit with them in the right way. They might they, they might read that as alignment be, between funders and like the major publishers. And it, that's not quite how I'm envisioning this, at least um, in terms of how we're understanding alignment. I kind of see it as like when we, when CIHR talks to researchers about barriers and challenges they're facing in terms of um, doing data management, sharing their data and so on. One challenge that, that I certainly detect is that uh, as we move forward to implement uh, data policies at um, uh, at funders and also in, in uh, when publishers do this, the resulting kind of policy requirement environment has to be seamless for researchers. Like they cannot be responding to uh, conflicting requirements. Um, from CIHR's point of view, we'd like to ensure that um, when uh, kind of a, a researcher is complying with any policies we have uh, that, that, you know, they, our policies won't complicate the researcher's life in terms of what that researcher has to do in responding to certain journal, journal policies. policies. Uh, partly, uh, we, we, we want to ensure that because we just don't want to create trouble for our, our researchers, but also in terms of fostering, uh, you know, an open data uh, policy and, or research uh, ecosystem, um, that, that that, that would be a big barrier uh, that would limit compliance if researchers did have these kind of conflicting requirements and so on that they were uh, needing to comply with. So, so that's kind of the, the sense of at least my own personal view right now. Uh, that's how I'm kind of seeing like the word alignment. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I read alignment as blindly following whatever mm -hmm. alignment yeah. is proposed, okay? I'm kind of dramatic, as you know. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. This is being recorded. I should not say that. Um, Fiona, you've been um, providing some context on other initiatives in this space. Do you want to add anything? Oh, thanks, Ian. No, um, so yeah, really interesting session overall, you know, totally by the way. Yeah, but I, I just wanted to, to flag up, I guess, that um, there's a bit of precedent for, for um, using this particular data policy, you know, this interest group um, for um, you know, gaining community feedback and, um, and wider perspective as the Belmont Forum, which um, Jeremy well, well knows is a consortium of like about 24 or so national funders who are looking for a, a, a policy uh, around data that was consistent um, basically from the point of view of writing calls to, um, to actually then um, being uh, useful and workable um, from the publishing end. Um, so there, there was quite a lot of, of work um, done um, around that sort of um, externally from the um, from this RDA group but we, we basically throughout the project which is about 18 months from about sort of 2016 2017 we um, we presented sort of every time and we, we um, absolutely re refined we got, we got really great feedback and a really kind of good international perspective 
I think, on, the, on what was actually um, available at the time and what was the state of knowledge. Um, and I think as well, um, we were able to contribute to, to, the, you know, to this group's thinking and, um, and um, you know, thinking about what, what frameworks, what, what aspects policies needed to, to, to have. Um, and I think what was also great was it, it opened up this possibility for the funders and a, a group of publishers to um, have a really good constructive conversation. I think people felt it was a very positive experience as well. So I think it would be great um, to be able to build on, on some of the things that, that came from, from that. So I think there were few, um, at least a few people um, on this call who, who have, were involved with that as well. Uh, yeah, I think that'd be great. And thank you for the suggestion. Um, I think I may have seen that uh, was the link to those Belmont, that Belmont material shared in the collaborative notes, or if it wasn't, I mean, I'd be very happy if there's anything online to, uh, uh, to read. Yeah, I can, I can put some more um, links in the notes, um, if you like. And actually, there's also some links on the STM research data webpage, because um, ah. put them up on those as well. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Can I just make a comment on the features here that are coming up? Um, so what's really interesting is that data management plans are coming up as, um, you know, a number of people have mentioned that as being the most important feature. And that's interesting because when we wrote our master journal guidelines, we kind of debated about whether DMPs should be in there, um, mainly because we started this a couple of years ago, I think, but uh, it's a bit a long piece of work, but also it was very cutting edge and probably still is in terms of journal data policies. They don't mention DMPs. Very few um, publishers require data management plans, um, but it's interesting to see it coming up here. And the other comment I'd make here is repositories. So repositories is coming up where, where do you deposit the data, which repositories and allowing authors flexibility to choose which one to deposit in. And that was also a very hot topic of our master journal policy discussion. It came up in every community call we had, um, particularly within RDA. It's a, it's a very um, controversial kind of area um, to, to cover in this. So this, this is my reflection on watching what's coming in here. Thanks. Um, I think we have one other question, don't we, as well? Yes, we um, we've, we've got about four and a half minutes left, but um, it's quite poignant because it's it's about, you know, if we want to take on any more work, <laughs> what, um, <laughs> what, uh, what, what other opportunities could be, could be explored? Um, or if, you know, your, your, less in favor of, of funder publisher policy alignment being the next problem to solve, if you like, um, or maybe opportunities for um, you know, further outreach um, around the work that's already been done with this group um, might be interesting. Um, so while folks are thinking about their answers to that question, I'll give another plug for the, the, the funders interest group, which is in the next breakout session. Um, I won't mention the time because it'll be irrelevant to a lot of people, but it's um, it's a bit later on, <laughs> right before the closing plen plenary. Um, so does anyone have any um, questions they want to raise? I did, um, I noticed um, if you're still here, um, Maria, Amalia, you, you, you were mentioning some really interesting comments right at the start in the Zoom chat. Um, and um, I just wondered if you wanted to, to reiterate or pick up on any of the points there that you shared, particularly as re relates to you know, local, local needs, perhaps. Thank you, Drain. Do you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, no, uh, really, I'm just taking notes and learning a lot about all the, what you have seen. And, and thank you very much, but, but um, became nervous when I come in in the in the audio. So no, no, the, the notes are enough. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Well, thank you anyway for the comments and, and the questions at the at the start. Um, it's great the... to have someone who's actually in Costa Rica on the call too. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. <laughs> um, we have a comment. Uh, I think maybe more of a comment than a question, uh, Nina. Uh, really important and great initiative. Thanks for the presentations. Um, 
a, a volunteer to contribute, uh, Jeremy, I think that's for you from the RE3 data project um, uh, with regards to the, the initiative around potential funder publisher policy alignment. Okay, so just seeing that's still plenty to do on publisher on publisher <laughs> yeah. policies there as well. I think, um, yeah, I think we could you choose your preferred metaphor, but you know, I like running. So marathon, not a sprint is probably uh, an appropriate one at this point. Um, so Natasha, do you have any um, cogent reflections on the session that you wanted to share before we wrap? Um, I'm sorry, there was a couple of other comments uh, there. Um, there's one about engaging the data repository community. Their voice seems absent from all of this. They have been involved in all of the community calls that we've had and sessions. Here, I don't know if you want to add to that, Ian. But... Um, yeah, I think that we, we've certainly tried our hardest to involve um, different stakeholders. Um, I certainly can, uh, yeah, I, 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 can, I, I, rec I can recognize that repositories and institutions um, haven't been discussed quite so much as stakeholders and one could argue maybe certainly for institutions there's there's even more of those than there are funding agencies so um, thinking about that certainly important I know that one of the very early pieces of previous work that we found um, Simon Hodson and um, uh, was involved with it was trying to look at standards for institutional policies as well there's a report in Zenodo so yeah that's another important and potentially big topic and particularly as as relates to to funder policies oftentimes as well um, so i think that does pretty much draw us to a close in terms of next steps we have plenty more to do yoris has plenty more to do with collaborators <laughs> and we're going to continue no doubt this conversation um in in uh the funder session later on so um i will just thank but, everyone for their contributions and yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, Ian. Could I just ask, Yanis, is, is there, um, are you writing up your experience of um, your pilot in any journal? Yes, I, I mean, it's probably it's not appropriate to, to, to tell because it's under review, or, but uh, okay. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, the RDA uh, special um, uh, part of the uh, data science journal that we, uh, try to uh, publish, but it's still under review. Okay. Okay, thank well, you. That was, yeah. If you could let us know when it's out, we'll share it with the group. Yeah, we will be delighted. Thank you. Okay, uh, excellent. Well, glad to hear that um, it's already in the works potentially at a journal. Um, and thank you, uh, Yanez, and, and again, to all our speakers, uh, Natasha for um, herding everyone for this, for this session. Um, particularly at what is now 4.30 in the morning. Um, <laughs> and Simon as well, I can see he's still, still online there. Um, so yeah, I think we should close there and um, wish everyone um, a wonderful end to the conference. And hopefully before long, we can all be doing this in person again soon. So good morning, good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you all, bye. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. I wonder if they will save the chat because there were a lot of good things in the chat.